Good evening, my friends, and welcome to this Reflection on the Rock on Friday, February 24th. We begin this evening with a hymn uh, that I'm going to quote in our opening prayer and also at the closing reflection called Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Let us pray. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Amen. Our reading this evening um, is from the book of Romans, and um, as I will say in the reflection, Paul isn't beating around the bush at all. And so now Bob is going to read these words from, and you might want to grab your Bible, Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 19. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given. But it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Still, everyone died from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. Even those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ, who is yet to come. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and the gift of forgiveness. To many, through this other man, Jesus Christ. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads us to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. For the sin of this one man Adam caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and the gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. Well, what do we say about that? This reading is included in um, scripture lessons for um, designed for the first Sunday of Lent. And Paul's letter uh, to the Romans um, uh, means that we are beginning Lent with a very sobering um, consideration of the scope of not only our own personal sins, but the sins that contribute to society the sins of society. And as I said, um, Paul does not beat around the bush. 
Uh, he is offering us a dire and sobering understanding of sin and the consequences of um, not tending to its truth. Now, a very common and what I've come to understand is a very superficial definition of sin is distance from God. Now, Christopher Bealey, who's a theologian in the Anglican tradition, he takes it even a bit further, the definition of sin. He says, sin is dehumanizing and anti-life, which makes my definition a little paltry. But Paul, bless his heart, he takes his definition even further. For Paul, sin is the character of our own wills to willfully oppose God at the risk of our own soul's well-being. Willfully. Sin is willful disobedience to the will of God. And I think what that means for those of us who have been going to church now for years and worshiping for years, we can't say we didn't know sin was that bad. I mean, it's right here. Romans 5, 12 to 19. And neither can we say, but I feel very close to God especially in Jesus. I'm, I'm not distancing myself from God. But I think that might be the first sign of hubris. Now, Lent is the season where we are confronted by being very honest, brutally honest with ourselves to repent of our willfulness and to ask for forgiveness. And then we have to change our ways. We listen for Jesus. We do a gut check every time we consider whether something is my will or your will or God's will. Because sin is not God's intention for humankind. God's intention for us is to emulate Jesus, to make those personal sacrifices that bring our lives in line with God's intended purpose for our lives. To do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with God to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves, to worship no other gods, small g, before our God. Now, Paul is answering the question in this portion of Romans, well, in that case, can I be saved from the enormity of my sin? And Paul's answer is yes. We are saved from the propensity of sin, the depth of sin, and our vast willfulness for sin through Jesus' very impressive gift of grace. Now, whereas sin represents the, our worst selves, um, the worst of our human society, grace is far, far greater. Grace is the best of what God's holiness gives us. And grace represents the will of God who willfully offers a pardon for sin and an assurance of unconditional love. 
And so Lent becomes for us a time to exercise that self-discipline that demonstrates a willful obedience to God's will in a way that's guided by the love and grace of Jesus. And it's as simple as that and as profoundly sobering as that. Paul is talking about the difference between life and death. And as the opening hymn said, grace greater than our sin, marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace receive? Let us pray. O oh God, just as we look into a mirror to see any soiled spots on our face, so let us look to you in order to understand the things we have done amiss. We are like a reed shaken in the wind. We are inexpressibly weak. Leave us not to ourselves but dwell in our hearts and guide our thoughts and actions. In Jesus' saving name we pray. Amen. Sunday's scripture reading is uh, the, the um, temptation of Christ, and it's from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. And we'll take a look about uh, a little bit about how this passage in Romans um, plays out in uh, this story of Jesus' temptation in the desert. William and Gloria Gaither, they're a, they were a re really prolific songwriting team. And, and in the early 70s, they wrote a hymn that speaks um, to the power of God's pardon in our lives and of the death of Jesus. And the lyrics are the closing benediction. God sent the Son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. So we close with that, because he lives.